So, I mean, this is the moment where I was supposed to ask, say there are a couple of seats, but it's, we're so packed in up there. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to you all. Um, so, this is our opening convocation, and I'm going to say just one brief word off script, which some of you may notice that I have on this groovy medallion. Um, if you've watched Undercover Brother, it's not quite like that medallion, um, but it has our magic number 47 on it, and it was a gift from an alumnus from the class of 1968, and he made it from stones that he found in um, Hawaii and in Africa and put them together and made it for me, which I think is just the coolest thing on earth. So that's my 47 medallion um, story. Um, and if you have learned, you'll learn more about 47, but you can't have this. <laughs> until you become president and then I'll pass it on. <laughs> so I've been here just over a year and my welcome feels a little different this time. Um, I now know firsthand what a wonderful place this college is and I'm even prouder to be part of it than I was this time last year. Um, I'm especially pleased to welcome the class of 22 and all of the new students who are coming across our quad along with our trustees and our faculty and staff. Um, you are really special people and it's great to be here with you. Now convocation uh, is the act of calling people together and we are going to be launching a new kind of life together. Uh, and you know, launches are not for the timid. Now there's gonna be lots of times when you come in late to lectures and it's gonna be totally okay. So I'm just gonna say a couple of nonsense words and tell everybody <laughs> until everybody gets seated, because it's not a welcome if you can't hear it. So we'll just get settled in, and it'll just take a minute. How about those ravens? <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. So when we come together for convocation, uh, we're launching a new academic year, a new life together. Um, and launches really are not for the timid. Uh, this room is packed full of talent and brain power behind me, in front of me, above me, all of you. And I'm confident that this place will enhance both what you already have um, and what you find while you're here. Um, my hope is that there are other traits that you'll acquire or strengthen. Uh, work on your empathy, your creativity, your perceptiveness. But today I really want to encourage you guys to be brave. Now, I don't have to sing the song, though I really like it. Um, that one of the things you're going to do is have to open up your mouth, but sometimes you're going to have to close it, too. And to have courage to know when to do both um, will be important, because as Churchill told us, courage is the only virtue that guarantees the rest of them. Whether you call it dissolve, determination, grit, or bravery, courage is something we can never have in excess, and most of what you do here will require it. Whether it's critical academic inquiry, political activism, volunteering in the community, welcoming in those who are outside, speaking up when others are silent, choosing silence so as to be heard above the clanging and the clamor, humility when you know you are wrong, all of that requires courage. Courage to ask difficult questions, Resolve to advocate for a cause. Determination to leave our community better by virtue of your presence here. Grit to, to press on. Bravery to admit weakness. I'm thinking about that a lot this past week because we lost a very brave person on August 16th. Um, the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, passed away. And I had the really great good fortune to get to meet her about three years old. And it was like um, having the breath taken out of you as she walked by. Um, she was a preacher's daughter who became music royalty, but she led a really difficult life. Um, when she was six years old, her parents separated, her mother moved out, her dad was on the road a lot, um, and her mother died of a heart attack when Aretha was 10. You know, she had two children by the time she was 17, one when she was 12. She had her share of turbulent and violent marriages. She herself suffered from alcoholism. But over the course of her life, she's still saying about faith. She's still saying about freedom. She's saying about struggle. I've been in the storm too long. But she gave voice to surmounting how I got over. Her music exploded, breaking records, earning honors that still stagger, including 100 singles on the Billboard, 18 Grammys, the first woman in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She moved effortlessly between genres from soul to R&B, gospel, gospel, jazz, and pop, everything but speed metal and maybe the polka. 
Um, she became a critic's darling. She sang before presidents. Unexpectedly for her, though, her songs also served as soundtracks to the civil rights and the women's movements. Respect and think became anthems for women. Young, gifted, and black spoke of black empowerment. She sang defiantly. She performed masterfully. And at a time when being young, black, and a woman was, there were three high walls, all but sure to present, prevent success, she scaled each one. She told Ebony Magazine, it's the rough side of the mountain that's the easiest to climb, the smooth side doesn't have anything to hold on to. She didn't lead a perfect life. Some of it was pockmarked with trouble of her own making. But what marks Aretha's story is she was indomitable and she never stopped climbing. She was determined to entertain, to empower, and always to sing. She was singing for her life, not merely for a living. And she never lost her courage. The thing about courage and bravery are they're never necessary until suddenly they are. Find your inspiration in the challenge itself. Make mistakes. That's OK. Missteps mean you're still moving. Don't limit yourself to your probabilities. Think big. Think possibilities and be brave enough not only to keep going, but to go beyond. And get a good soundtrack for it. Doesn't have to be Aretha, but there's somebody who's going to inspire you to lift your feet up higher every day. Now, you're not alone here. One of the most important things to you remember is that there are 1,600 students at Pomona. There are 200, more than 200 faculty members. There's staff here who will help you. Just ask. There was a story, I got a long email from one of your parents. He said he was walking across campus on the first day and he saw a blind damaged on one of the buildings. And he immediately told one of the grounds folks, um, it turned out to be Orlando, whom I know, and, and he said, okay, we'll get right on it. And then he said, oh no, that's never gonna happen. And so he walked in and he pointed out to someone else. And they said, oh no, Rosa's coming to fix it. And then by the end of the day, it was fixed because he asked for help. And we always answer that call. So please do it. Now, no matter what happens, however you may feel, you're stronger than you know. However tested you are, let triumph fall from your lips. Don't stop your own singing. In the shower, in your room, annoy the heck out of your sweet mates. You can do it. We can do more than just chirp. Something amazing has started today. This is the beginning of a new song. This is the beginning of a new ascent. And in that vein, I'd like to welcome Assistant Professor of Music, Melissa Givens, trumpet instructor, Raymond Burkhardt, and the college organist, William Peterson, to perform a selection from Handel, because there's nothing like a good soundtrack. Welcome. Welcome. 